Please open your Bibles up to Matthew. We're going to be in chapter 12. We're going to talk a little bit more. Last week we started talking about a topic that uh, I would say is pretty controversial. And uh, it's been the topic of a lot of uh, arguments and uh, church splits, if you will. Um, you know, it's really sad to, to see how, that that happens. It's, it's unfortunate that uh, uh, we can't just take the Scripture for what it says. You know, it's unfortunate that we find ourselves always, well, not us, but f- people find themselves skipping over things that might be uncomfortable or maybe things that are kind of deep, complicated, so to speak. And this topic that we have been talking about uh, last week and today, it is a little bit deep. Um, it's not for Sunday school, that's for sure. But, you know, I, I trust that we are circled with a bunch of uh, Bible students in here, that you like to study the Word of God, uh, because we know that that really does bring uh, uh, health and direction into our lives. So open up to chapter 12. And uh, we know that Jesus had been doing some miracles, um, casting out demons, and we have spoke about that, um, healing people with sicknesses, uh, all manner of uh, miracles he was doing on other people's behalf. And, you know, someone would ask, sometimes I've had them ask me and say, well, why, why doesn't he heal everybody? I mean, you know, these people that he healed in the Bible, why didn't he heal them all? Why doesn't he heal all of us? Well, gosh, if he healed all of us, we'd never go to heaven. I don't know. But I know this. I know that when he did this in the Bible, in in the New Testament times, he was doing it for a specific purpose. He was doing it to proclaim who he was to the world. He was doing it to prove that he, unlike anybody else, was the true living God in flesh, walking on the earth among men. This topic of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, I want to continue talking about that this morning. Um, If you look in chapter 12, and I want to start reading in verse 31. Now, this scripture that I'm going to read to you, he spoke this, these are his words, after he was accused of casting out a demon by the power of demons, or by the power of Satan. And so he responds to that uh, by saying this in verse 31, Therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks a word against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, neither in this age or in the age to come. Now, depending on where you come from and your background with the Bible and your Christian faith, um, this can be a very, very terrifying two verses right here. Many, many people live their lives fearing that they have committed this sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So what exactly does it mean, that word, blaspheme? It basically says that when you do something good or when God has done something miraculous, that we give the credit to the devil for what he's done, saying that it was the spirit of the devil that cast out the demons in this man right here. These people were on the verge. Now, they hadn't uh, sealed the deal. But Jesus is saying that you're on the verge of committing this sin. Beware of what you say. Now, there's a diff- lot of, you know, you can be blasphemed. You could be doing good things and people can speak evil of you. 
And, you know, Jesus told us about that. He said when people do that to us, we're supposed to pray for them. But Jesus is telling us here in our passage this morning that if a person does that to us, he can be forgiven of that. And it even goes further than that. If a person blasphemes the Son of Man, and that is Jesus, he can be forgiven that. But that blaspheming of the Holy Spirit, why is that so unique? Why is that so firm? The words that he says to us in this passage, there's no room for wiggling around here. I wanted to share a few things with you about the Holy Spirit, um, or the Spirit of God, if you will, or some people call Him the Holy Ghost. Some people, you know, have different terms uh, for it. But basically, what we're talking about is we're talking about the Holy Spirit, the, the part of the Trinity that we refer to. We have the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, there are those today that would say, if you believe in the Trinity, that you don't believe what's true. Um, I'm pretty convinced that the Bible teaches that there's a Trinity, that there's a Father and a Son and a Holy Spirit, and that there's three in one, and that all three are one, and all three are God. So when Jesus came to the earth in His flesh, as a matter of fact, the Scripture tells us that He literally stepped down out of His glory. He became a man. He was all man. At the same time, he was all God. We find when he deals with legion, when he casts out those demons that legion had, you may remember that story, that the authority that he wields is so great and so powerful that there was no resistance there was no battle. There was no contest there. He commanded it. It happened. Now, was that Jesus, the man, that did that? Or was that the Spirit of God dwelling within that man, Jesus? It was the power of God. We couldn't do anything like that in our flesh. No one could ever do anything like that in their flesh. And so we have to try to separate here between um, the man, Jesus, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Jesus is saying, you know what, if you want to put me down in the flesh as a man, I'll forgive you for that. And there's a lot of things that Jesus did to show, to prove that the Spirit of God literally occupied him. He was, if you want to say, he was possessed by the Holy Spirit. Amen? And isn't that what God wants for us too? I mean, think about it. Maybe that word possessed is a little bit scary. I like the word that he wants to dwell within us. He wants to live in us. He wants to be that intricate part of my life. So how do I get there? And what role does the Holy Spirit have in this whole thing? He told his disciples one day, he said that the Spirit is with you. It's been with you. And the Spirit will be in you. So I'm having to look at this and say, well, there's two different aspects of what the Holy Spirit's doing here. On one hand, He's with me. He's with the disciples. They're growing. They're learning. But He's walking beside them. He's walking beside us even before we knew the Lord, specifically before we knew the Lord. You ever wonder, some of you out there ever wonder why you're still breathing? Huh? You ever wonder why, you know, some of the crazy dumb things we might have done could have snuffed us out and it really should have been over a long time ago, but I don't know how, I'm still here. Well, do you think it's possible that the Holy Spirit was with you, that the Holy Spirit was protecting you from your own self at times, preserving your life because God knew something about you before you knew it about yourself? And that was that you would come to Him, that you would surrender your life to Him. 
So on one aspect, we have the Holy Spirit with us. The second part of that is that we have the Holy Spirit in us. That happens when you become born again. That's when that happens. You know, when Jesus told his disciples that, he didn't tell them he's with you and in you. He said, right now he's with you, but he will be in you. And of course, that didn't take place until after the resurrection when when God sent the Holy Spirit to the church. And you know, specifically, that's what he did. That's what the Father did. He sent the Holy Spirit to the church, to the believers in Jesus Christ. And I love this word. He sent it to the bride, of which we are the bride of Christ. And we're going to see in the scripture this morning that he makes wonderful promises to us concerning this relationship that we can have with the Holy Spirit. You know, Paul, in one of his letters, he says, um, oh, no, I'm sorry, I believe it was John. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. But whoever does not confess that Jesus is the Christ does not know God. Jesus told um, Nicodemus that if you don't believe in being born again, if you don't believe in me, you're condemned already. We're already condemned before we ever come to the cross. Is there anybody in here that's not guilty? Anybody? I'd love to meet you. I would hang out with you. But we're all guilty. We all have broken God's law. And there's an accountability that comes with violating what we know to be right and true. And you know what? Here's the good news, though. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he made me white as snow. It was Jesus. It was the Holy Spirit with me. And I come to the cross, perhaps broken, you know, many, I hope all of you, as you have come to the cross, you have found a sense of brokenness in your heart, in your spirit, that you've come to a place in your life where you realize that life really is empty. There's never enough. How much is enough? There's never enough. The things of the world do not satisfy, so there's a constant lifelong battle to try to fill that urge that's in me with the things of the world, and it doesn't matter how much we have. It's never enough, because there's an there's a empty space in you and I before we know the Lord, and in that empty space, nothing in the world, nothing in the flesh, no material thing can fill that void, only God can fill that void in us. And and I'm thankful this morning that he put that void in us because that's what caused us to seek him out. And so the Holy Spirit being with us as we're going through life and we're learning life's lessons and we're seeing the futility of things and our own mortality and our opinions and our hearts begin to change and we realize we're very, very small. We're really not that important after all. We're here for a little while, and then we're gone. And it's really kind of sad because, you know, I really don't know anything about my great-grandparents. I don't know what they did for a living. I don't know what they liked. How soon does the memory of us fade? Very soon. Too soon. And it kind of gives you this sense of, what am I even here for? Do I have a purpose in being here? Yes, we do. That we might have an encounter with the living God, that he might come and dwell within us. Jesus said, we will come and make our abode with you. We're going to live with you. There's a process here that I wanted to share with you. If you would flip over to the Gospel of John with me, I would appreciate that. We're going to look at some passages over there that will kind of clarify maybe a little bit of what I'm trying to share with you this morning. So the first place I want to go is chapter 14 of the Gospel of John. In this time of Jesus' ministry, um, he was getting very close to the cross. 
His time was running short, and he began to share some really heavy-duty things with his 12, with the special ones that he had chosen. And one of the things he tells us that is that he's going to go away. He tells his disciples, I'm going to be going away. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go to prepare a place for you. And, and if I do, if I prepare that place for you, I'll come back for you. And I'll receive you, and I will take you to that place that I have prepared for you. Well, think of the 12 sitting there listening to these words. They don't have a clue what he's talking about. Are you heading north to build a big house for us? Or, you know, is it going to be a beach house? Or where are you going, and when will you be back? And, and he's telling them, you don't know where I'm going, and you can't follow me there. And they're beginning to get a little bit despondent. I mean, how would you feel? If Jesus came to us and said, well, I'm not going to be hanging with you anymore. I'm going to go away, leave you alone, all by yourself, to face life. I would be trembling in my boots. I would be so despondent, I wouldn't know what to do. So what he wants to do here for us and for his disciples is he wants to let us know that there is a plan that he has. So if you learn chapter 14... Look at verse 15 in that chapter. This is a really short verse, but it's really, really powerful. If you love me, keep my commandments, period. You know what? That's everything sewed up into one little sentence. If you love me, keep my commandments. Because God doesn't want us keeping the commandments out of legalism or weighty uh, threats upon us. He wants us to do it because we love him. He wants us to be in church together because we want to be in church together. Not because we're afraid that we might go to hell if we miss a Sunday. Right? He wants us to serve him because we want to, not because we have to. That's the difference between a religious spirit and a, and a relationship spirit. You guys that are married, you know what I'm talking about. You take care of your wife and you protect her and you honor her because you love her and you want to. That's a very important aspect and I believe that that's a mirror of what God is trying to share with us when it comes to serving Him. Now look at verse 16. He says, I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him, look at this, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I referred to that earlier. I want to point something out. It's not an it. It's not karma. It's not the force be with you. It's none of that stuff. It is a he. The Holy Spirit is a he, a him. He's a person. And he can be hurt. He can be grieved. He'll respond to how we respond to him. How many of you know that in your Christian life, you have to have the Holy Spirit living in you to empower you to navigate the craziness in the world out there today? He's our compass. Between the Holy Spirit and God's word, it provides a path for us, a compass of what is true and what is not true. So he promises them that this other helper, another helper, will be coming. In verse 18, he said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. A little while longer, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. And in that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me, and I in you. What a beautiful picture there. 
We're in the Father with Jesus. We're all in, the, in this together, so to speak. Verse 21 is interesting. He says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it's he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. This is a beautiful relationship we're talking about. But how does that come about? And I wanted to read another passage out of this chapter too, a couple of more passages. Look at verse 25. It says, These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the helper, whom he referred to earlier, and you may have asked, who is the helper? Well, he clarifies it right here. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and he will bring to your remembrance all the things that I have said to you. So the Holy Spirit has a specific ministry, and it's you and me. The Holy Spirit has a specific ministry in order that we might have a relationship with God. He's the one who teaches us. You know, I'm sure you notice on Sunday, before we open the Bible, we always pray and we ask the Holy Spirit, teach us today, Lord. Speak to our hearts. It doesn't matter if you're the mouthpiece or if you're sitting and listening. It's the same Holy Spirit that ministers to all of us as we study His Word together. It's an amazing, beautiful, beautiful thing. Look over in uh, chapter 15. Over by, let's see, verse 22. Now, you might remember that these religious guys in Matthew were accusing Jesus of doing great miracles with the power of God by the power of Satan. And in verse 22, he says, If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, then they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. Again, I want to draw a correlation between the physical flesh Jesus and the deity Jesus. And when Jesus is speaking about the great things that he did, he's speaking of the deity, the power of God that he has. And when people begin to deny the Holy Spirit or the power of God in Christ, they're treading on thin ground right there. Look at verse 26. This is a very insightful one. When the Father, when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Now that's intense. He's telling us exactly what the ministry of the Holy Spirit's going to be. He's going to bring things to our remembrance. He's going to teach us, and he's going to anoint us. He will be in us. And then we find that he, his ministry, is to testify of Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It's the Holy Spirit that brings us to the cross. It's the Holy Spirit that testifies of Jesus. Now, these men who were threatened by the Lord, these men who were trying to silence him by probably some of the stupidest logic that you could possibly imagine, right? I mean, who in the world would come up with that one unless you're really desperate? Oh, he's doing great things and helping people because of the power of the most evil thing in the universe, right? How stupid. <laughs> I'm sorry. God, Jesus was a lot more merciful to them than I would have been, I think, you know, because he actually wants to explain it to them. But uh, So when he tells us the helper is going to come, all right, I want to know exactly what this helper is going to do. I've already learned through the Scripture that he is going to point the way to Jesus. I've already learned in the Scripture he's going to guide me to the cross. 
He'll be with me until that time comes when I surrender to my maker, to my creator, to my savior, to my God. And then at that point, he will be in me. Verse, uh, or chapter 16. He's talking about going away. And they're really bumming out because he's talking about leaving them. Look at verse 5 of chapter 16. It says, but now I go away to him who sent me. Speaking of the Father. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he comes, here we go again, what is his ministry? He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, and of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Again, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you of things to come. And he will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. The ministries of the Holy Spirit are plural. We're seeing here that there are many ministries that the Holy Spirit has. One of them that's really important, it tells us that he will convict the world of sin. Did you know it's the Holy Spirit that convicts you of sin? That's what he's saying right here. Perhaps without the Holy Spirit, we would never be feeling like we're we're doing wrong. We wouldn't have the insight. We wouldn't have the the, the perspective of God to know that I'm living in sin and I've fallen short of the glory of God. I'm guilty. And I've already been convicted. I just haven't been sentenced yet. You know, every trial you go to, you're found guilty first and then you go back later and they sentence you to whatever punishment you're going to be punished with. And Jesus is telling us, you've already been found guilty in God's court. We've all been found guilty. Sentencing time is coming. But here's the thing. I'm going to take your sentence upon myself, he said. I'm going to pay the price for you. I'm going to do your time. I'm going to go to the cross and suffer the death penalty in your place. And that's exactly what he did. He went and he died, and he took the judgment that I deserved, and he put it upon himself. So the Holy Spirit, first of all, going to convict us or the world of sin. He says it's going to convict the world of sin because they do not believe in him. Verse 9. Now remember, the Holy Spirit's job is to point people to Jesus. The Holy Spirit's job is to show people that Jesus truly was the Messiah. You know, Jesus wasn't his first name and Christ wasn't his last name. You know that, right? I mean, we all have two names, maybe more. But his name, literally, Jesus, it was the name of God. God with us, that was his name. That was his title, if you will, God in the flesh. And his mission, he was the Christ. He was the Savior of the world. He came to save us. So within his name, you find the name of God, and you find the the word for him being our Messiah. I think in the uh, Hebrew tongue, I think it's, or is it Greek or I don't know, Yeshua HaMashiach. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus the Christ. It's not a first and last name. It tells us who he is. And every spirit that confesses who he is is from God. 
So sometimes we, we walk around and we throw that name around like it's just common stuff. You know, oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah, I know Jesus Christ, you know. Been hanging out with him for a long time. I know him. Well, when we know what his name means, it changes everything. It's not just a name. It's his power and it's his mission. And he's going to convict the world of sin because they do not believe in him, of righteousness because he's going to the Father and you'll see him no more. He's going to prove that he was the perfect, unspotted Lamb of God who took the sins of the world upon himself because he's going to be accepted by the Father in righteousness and he's going to go to be with the Father forever. And then finally, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. That is the adversary. That is the devil. That is the usurper, the prince of the world, if you will, who is usurping this planet, the authority, but not for very long. Another interesting thing about the Holy Spirit is that he doesn't take any glory to himself. He, verse 14, will glorify me. The Holy Spirit is going to point to Jesus every time. That's another part of his mission or his ministry, if you will. So if the Holy Spirit is the very thing that brings me to the cross, if the Holy Spirit is the thing that guides me to Jesus, if the Holy Spirit is the thing that convicts me of sin, and I blaspheme that, or if I reject that, that I'm literally rejecting salvation. I'm literally telling God, I don't want your spirit. I don't want to be convinced of sin. I don't want anything to do with it. I reject it. Have anybody in here, have you ever rejected God sometime in your life? I know there's some have. It's kind of common. We reject God when we turn and walk away from him. I don't want to serve you anymore. I want to go do my thing. You know, I'm a college student. I want to party, whatever. We reject the things of God and we walk away. I think in one way or another, everybody's done it. But with the Holy Spirit there, he brings us back, doesn't he? And here's something that, that's important. If you got breath in your lungs, there's hope for you. If they got breath in their lungs, no matter what's coming out of their mouth, if they've got breath in their lungs, there's hope for them. Are you worried about that today? That you perhaps have committed this unpardonable sin? I can tell you for sure you haven't. Because if you did, you wouldn't be here. Right? You wouldn't be seeking out the things of God if you rejected the Holy Spirit, if you blasphemed the very thing that God is using to bring you to Christ. Is there salvation in any other besides Jesus? Absolutely not. So if the Holy Spirit is the very thing that introduces me to that, that brings me into that, that teaches me, comforts me, empowers me, reminds me, it's all the Holy Spirit. And what is He doing He's given all that glory to Jesus. So he's pointing to the Lord. You know, you read these letters in the Bible from Paul and some of these other writers, and they say, you know, I'm writing you in the name of the Father and of Jesus Christ, his Son. You never really see in the greeting where he says, I'm writing you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You don't see that. Because the Holy Spirit is authoring the letter. The Holy Spirit is not pointing to himself. He tells us right here. He's glorifying Jesus. The Holy Spirit has a very selfless ministry to point to Jesus. And that very same spirit that points us to Jesus is the very same spirit that takes us all the way through life as believers. When you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, I got to tell you this because it's been heavy on my heart lately. I've heard several people say this, that they've been possessed by a demon. Now, you know, people come from all kinds of backgrounds. 
But you cannot have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you and be possessed by a demon. You know that, don't you? I hope you know that. We need to know that. You know, people can have psycholo psychological problems. We can be on medication. There's all kinds of different problems that we can have. But you know what? You will never, ever have to worry about Satan occupying the Holy Spirit's house. That's you. It's real important. And it's also important for you to remember this morning that you have not committed the sin because you're seeking out God. You know, people ask me, well, what about deathbed confession? Guys rejected Jesus all of his life, lived a horrible life, and there he's lying in bed. He's come to grips with his mortality, and now he wants to get saved. Can that man be saved? I believe so. I believe so. That's why I said a minute ago, if you still got breath, if they've still got breath, there's still hope. Don't ever give up on anybody. You keep praying for your loved ones, right? You keep praying for those who are far from God. Huh. Here's the real kicker. We pray for our enemies. We pray for those who use us despitefully and disrespect us and talk about us and say horrible things. We pray for them. We don't seek vengeance. I'll tell you what. That's a real true litmus test as to if the Holy Spirit's dwelling in me or not. Or if I'm allowing him to have control of my life. He might be dwelling in me, but I might be squishing him. I might be going, shh, I don't want to hear it right now. Quit telling me what I already know, you know. I think unforgiveness is probably one of the hardest things that we deal with as human beings And when Jesus throws that out there, we think, that's impossible. And it is. I've had lots of people tell me, I'll never forgive that person for what they did to me. It is impossible for us. But all things are possible with God. God can give me a perspective on things that reminds me, hey, look, you're not so great yourself. Right? Right? You deserve the same punishment as everybody else does, so what are you doing pointing and condemning other people? Sin has symptoms. And sometimes the red flags, they start popping up in our lives, and the Holy Spirit's speaking to us, and he's saying, ah, oh, don't go that direction. Change course. Before you crash and burn, change course. So the Lord is very, very serious about the idea that the Holy Spirit is the very power that brings you and me to salvation. That's the bottom line. And by rejecting salvation, you may not think, oh, that person's just told me the other day they reject the Holy Spirit. They don't do that. They usually reject the Holy Spirit by rejecting Jesus. They reject the Holy Spirit by refusing God's free gift of salvation. There's no other name given under heaven by which a man might be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. And if I reject that, then there is no other way for me. That's why blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is unforgivable. Because it's the very thing that brings me to Christ. And if I reject Christ, I've rejected Him. If I reject Christ, I've rejected the Father. If I reject Christ, I've told the Holy Spirit, no thanks. You know, one of the things a lot of us learned over the years when we did give our lives to the Lord and maybe struggled, you know, I mean, a lot of us, they, we get saved, and we're pretty excited about it, and time kind of rolls along a little bit. Maybe we start getting a little loosening our grip a little, compromising in our lives, you know, things like that. And you step back out into the world thinking, you know, I've been a good boy now for two years. I deserve to go out and party a little bit. 
I'm sure God will understand. Right? Well, have you ever noticed if that's ever happened to you that partying just ain't much of a party anymore? Huh? Have you realized that? Have you thought, when I go back to the world, it actually stinks? It's ugly. Sin is nasty. And I can't believe that I was so attracted to it. But that's my flesh. That's my nature. But I want new nature. I want God's nature. I'm tired of being self-centered. I want to be Christ-centered. Right? I mean, you know, Jesus talks about us dying to ourselves. You know, if you want to follow him, you got to take up your cross and, and, you know, and follow him. And the cross is a method of death. So you got to die to yourself and to live for Jesus. So have you ever been to a funeral where maybe they're in the little box down here and you walk by and look at them? How much self-esteem do you think they got? I don't think they have any self-esteem. They're dead. And, and, and the Lord is telling us much in the same way. You die to yourself. Self-esteem is not the way. Christ's esteem is the way. And I found that if I put Christ first in my life, it's okay to be proud of myself. It's okay to say, wow, you've really changed and you really are doing well. Thank you, Jesus. Right? That's okay. But when we take self and we put him on the throne and we remove God from the throne, that's when we get in trouble. We become selfish. Terrible word. Selfish, right? Well, walking with Jesus is exactly the opposite of that. Jesus was not about being selfish at all. As a matter of fact, he's on his face before God in the garden, and he's saying, Father, if there is any way, if there's any way that we can go to plan B, I'd sure like to hear about it right now because they're fixing to nail me on the tree. But if not... If there is no plan B, which you already knew, your will be done, not mine. There's that bit powerful conflict between the life of the living and what the spirit knows it needs to do. Jesus knew he needed to lay down his life. He knew that there was no way around it. If he would have walked away from that garden, if he would have denounced who he was, you and I, we wouldn't be here today. We would still be in our sin. We would still be groping around in the darkness trying to figure it out. But this morning, the light has come on. And I want to tell you before we close this morning that Jesus is going to be coming back very soon for his bride. Now, you know, I've been looking at a few things lately, and I've found that a lot of pastors don't want to talk about this anymore. As a matter of fact, a lot of pastors don't even want to teach you from the Bible anymore. It's too controversial. There's hate speech and racism and all kinds of nasty things in there. And so they just write it off, and they move it to the side, and they move in other directions. This is the Word of God. It's alive. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces through my flesh, through my mind, and down into my very spirit of my being. And nothing else can do that. And I believe with my whole heart that you and I are living very close to that wonderful day when that trumpet's going to blow. And in the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we're going to find ourselves in the presence of God, in the presence of Jesus. We're all going to be in our wedding dress. <laughs> oh, I got to share this with you real quick. So we found a wedding dress the other day. It was outside here in a box. I don't know how it got there, but... So I brought it in. I didn't know what was in there, and we opened it up, and we're looking at it, and I'm thinking... That's really a pretty dress, you know. It's nice. Why would somebody leave it sitting on the sidewalk? And then they had the little thing that they wear that goes down, you know. What do you call that thing? The veil. Thank you, the veil. 
So I thought maybe when I was going to teach you about the Bride of Christ that I might put on the veil. My <laughs> Cindy's shaking her head. <laughs> Sorry, babe. She said, don't be a comedian when you get up there. But you know what, you guys? We have a wonderful future. We have a wonderful eternity ahead of us to spend with him as his bride. And this is the very thing that gets us up in the morning. This is the very thing that keeps us moving forward is knowing that we belong to him. And when he told his disciples, I will not orphan you, I will not abandon you, he was telling that to us too. He will never abandon you. Now we can abandon him, but he will never abandon us. And you know what I really love? I love the fact that even if I do walk away, even if we do stumble, he's still there waiting. It might even be years down the road, but he's still there waiting, right? The grace of God is an amazing thing. So this morning, I don't know where you're at. You might be struggling with this blaspheming, unforgiveness thing, and maybe you need some prayer, you know? Um, We'd love to uh, give you that opportunity. We'd love to have you meet with with Chris and Lonnie. Is that correct over here? Okay, I'm going to make sure. And uh, uh, even while we're doing our prayer, our two songs here to close, if you want to get some prayer, please make your way over there. Um, that's really an important thing, you know, uh, that we recognize our need and we accept that and we, go d- and we deal with it. So let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you this morning. Ah, oh, Lord, I, we're so humbled when we read these texts to know that really it's all about you. It's not about us. that we have one responsibility and that's to come to you, to lay down our will before you, to surrender our agenda to you. And we learn so quickly, Lord, that your plan for us is so much better than what we could ever plan. That you have a plan of goodness and, and prosperity and a love that will bring us through anything. We're so thankful for that today. So Lord, as we close this morning with these last couple of songs, as we prepare to go back out into the world, we know, Lord, that you go with us. We know that you are in us, and it's your desire to come upon us and to fill us. May we seek that out in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God mortal man you are not a god in need of anything we can give by your plan that's just the way it is you are god alone from before time began you are on your throne you are god
There is none more power.